Good evening, everyone, and good evening to those online. Thanks for coming. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Stuart Robinson. I'm a, a chiropractor by training, um, and I have a specialist interest in golf. I work a lot with golfers. Um, I've always enjoyed golf, always played a lot of golf, and uh, grew up playing a lot. My just to talk a little bit about my personal background and, and how I got to, to this stage. Um, I was playing county golf and things like that as a junior and then uh, experienced a back injury uh, which I found out was due to a, a stress fracture, a spondylolisthesis, which is quite a common injury. I'll perhaps talk a little bit more about that later on in the lecture. Um, but that meant that I needed to go and seek some, some treatment. I ended up going to see a a chiropractor, my dad's a, uh, a surgeon, and he uh, uh, found out about uh, a chiropractor who was well known for, for treating golfers and took me along, and, and this guy treated me, and, and that helped a great deal. And uh, on I went, I was studying science A levels at the time, uh, went on to do a human physiology degree at the University of St Andrews, and I was lucky to have a, an RNA golf scholarship while I was there. Really enjoyed the golf, and then subsequently went on to uh, uh, train to be a chiropractor. So I've been working out in practice, um, helping ordinary members of the population with back, neck, shoulder, knee, ankle injuries, and also obviously increasingly specialising in, in helping uh, golfers with their injuries, and also looking at um, performance training and biomechanical analysis to enhance uh, golfers' performance as well. So this evening we're going to be talking about golf injuries, uh, both in the young and the older golfer, how they arise, what to do about them when they arise, and how best to hopefully avoid them as well. So in terms of athleticism in golf, I think certainly in the past, uh, golf wasn't necessarily viewed as a particularly athletic sport, and, and people thought that it was something that you could just rock up go and swing the club, go and play. You didn't need to be in particularly good shape in order to play golf. But, but we as golfers, and particularly as professional golfers, you know differently. And certainly that's very evident looking at the best players in the world now. Uh, the vast majority of them are extremely good athletes, very fit, very strong, very flexible. And we need really all of those facets of fitness if we're going to consistently play golf well and we're going to reduce the risk of injury given the forces and the loads that are put through the body in the golf swing because really in many senses golf isn't a particularly natural movement for the human body. Uh, there are some elements to it that are but um, certainly the, the forces placed in certain areas are, are beyond those that you'd normally get um, in most other day-to-day -day, uh, situations and scenarios in life. So it's, it's important to think about physical training and to think about how you can maintain good fitness and good health um, and, as I say, help to reduce the stresses that the golf swing places on the body. However, there's an awful lot certainly online and an awful lot being talked about how you should do certain kinds of physical training and some people get involved with, whether it's Pilates or yoga or lots of weightlifting or an awful lot of running or cycling. So... I think it's worth at some point us also just discussing some of the, the better exercises to do as well because um, there are good ways and bad ways to approach maintaining a healthy body for golf but also uh, rehabilitating injuries as well. So it's finding the right balance of these things and for the amateur golfer, for, for those that you might well be coaching on a regular basis, they may well be sat like this over a computer for eight to ten hours a day, five or six days a week, they're going to be very stiff and inflexible in certain areas and um, they're not necessarily going to have particularly good core muscle control. So um, if they're very stiff in the areas that should be rotating effectively and they don't have very good core muscle control, then certainly they're going to be high loads in certain areas of the body and that's going to increase the likelihood of certain forms of injury. So we're going to start to, to talk about injuries and some specific injuries. I'm not going to talk about exhaustive lists of injuries, and I won't be talking about certain kinds of injury like fractures, you know, bone breaks. I'm not going to be talking about infections or, or tumours, so cancer. Um, these things all have to be considered by clinicians who are treating um, and uh, examining patients, but we're not going to be looking at that from the golf side of things. 
and, and that's beyond the scope of the talk this evening. So injuries and overuse syndrome. Uh, uh, syndrome. So this was a study that was done in the uh, American. It was published in the American Journal of, of Sports Medicine, and they were looking at the, the types of injuries that people were experiencing. So across 526 different golfers, they found that 82.6 percent of the reported injuries involved overuse situations, so repetitive strain essentially, and it was only 17.4 that were single traumatic one-off events. Professional golfers tended to injure their uh, backs, wrists and shoulders most commonly, while amateurs tended to report elbow, back and shoulder pain most commonly. And the severity of the injuries, well about 50%, just over 50% were seen as minor injuries, 25% <coughs> roughly were moderate injuries and about 20% were fairly major uh, injuries. Interestingly enough, carrying a golf bag actually proved to be more hazardous, so people were more likely to get injured, injured if they uh, carried their bag. And the lower back, shoulder and ankle were particularly vulnerable in that situation, you can imagine. The lower back, obviously, you've got the compressive loading of carrying the bag and the postures that it tends to bring you into when you're carrying the bag. The shoulders, again, people tend to get slightly rounded in the shoulders, which is potentially problematic carrying the bag for cumulatively maybe two and a half, three hours during the course of a round. And the ankles as well, if you've got increased loading on the spine, um, then obviously if you step in a hole or on an unstable surface, you're more likely to go over on the ankle and sprain the ankle. And we'll be talking more about those injuries as well. A question from Steve White. Uh, he has two herniated discs, L4 and 5. Right. I'm able to play golf, but the back aches like mad the following day. Okay. Well, we'll certainly be talking about spinal injuries and uh, disc-related injuries um, coming up very soon. So um, it's a difficult one to speak exactly precisely to you, Steve. Um, and I'm sorry that I can't give an entirely tailored answer to you here. But um, I'll certainly be dealing with injuries to the discs of the spine, why they happen, and we can maybe start to talk a little bit about um, what you can do about some of those things over the course of the next few minutes. And then if I haven't answered uh, all of those things, if you've got any specific questions at the end, I'll be very happy to answer those as well, if that's all right. Okay. So low back pain in professional golfers, it's exceptionally common. You gentlemen, obviously, we've been talking about that, and, and, mm -hmm. and you in the room certainly, unfortunately, know that. Um, so 33% of, of golfers um, in a study that was done in 2004 said they reported fairly regular uh, back pain. And um, there's a significant correlation, actually, between certain physical findings in professional golfers and them experiencing back pain. So it's not determining the causation. This study wasn't looking at the causative factors, it was just looking at the correlation of, of certain fi findings, physical findings. So the first one that they highlighted was decreased internal rotation of the lead hip. So if I'm talking too much jargon and uh, too much technical language, do just say, and I'll, I'll slow things down and, and explain a bit more. But So the lead hip, obviously right-handed golfer, that's the left hip. The reason that the internal rotation of the hips important. If you think about what's happening in the golf swing as we rotate down into impact and through, the foot staying relatively stable and, and still, and the pelvis is effectively rotating this way. So that's equivalent to the foot moving inwards if the pelvis was staying still, which is internal rotation. So we're effectively internally rotating on that left hip. So if that's reduced, you can imagine that's going to then start to cause increased stresses higher up the movement chain and unfortunately where's the next key point? It's the lower back. So that's certainly something that, that Steve who answered the questions about the, the bulging discs might want to think about how is his hip range of movement. Uh, that's certainly something to consider and I'll, I'll refer more to specific cases and things later on. Just from a coaching and technical standpoint, you might notice, and I've discussed this with quite a lot of pros over the years, the um, 
splaying out of the left foot in a right-handed player as they come down through into impact and then the left foot tends to slide outwards and rotate towards the target. That can often be due to a lack of rotation in the hip joint and so you've got the option of either having a break in the, the stresses either in the, in the lower back or the player may then try and unload through the foot instead the other end of the limb and then actually change their uh, relationship with the, with the ground so that they're reducing the stresses from the lower end of the limb rather than uh, concentrating them higher up. The other thing is that there's a test that we talk about in, in healthcare called the Faber test. And that's basically where you're producing a figure four like this in your hip and the hips being externally rotated like that and abducted slightly. Now, there was a positive correlation between people having back pain and a reduced distance in that Faber test as well. So again, checking that on each side will give an indication as to how much range of movement people have in their hips. <coughs> it also, back pain in professional golfers was also correlated with a reduction in extension of the spine. Now, that's correlation, not causation, because anyone who's had joint pain in the back, so facet joints are the ones that run down the spine here, and anyone who's had any joint pain there will find when they lean back like that, they're compressing those facet joints, and so that will tend to cause pain. So um, anyone experiencing pain is likely to have a reduction in that degree of movement because it's uncomfortable for them to do that. Um, but certainly... Um, movement can be restricted in that range in those who experience back pain. So certainly range of motion deficits in the lower back um, and in terms of extension um, in the lower back and rotation about the hips is a factor that's worth considering um, in, in back pain in, in golf as we know. It's not necessarily the cause but it's certainly related to it. This was an interesting study done in Australia. So it was a one-year follow-up study on golf injuries in amateur players. And the incidence over the course of one year was 15.8 injuries per 100 golfers. So nearly 16% of the amateur golfers followed for a year experienced an injury. So that's a, that's a fairly high injury rate. Recurrent injuries were the most common kinds of injury. Um, so again, the ones that people have suffered previously are these overuse injuries very often um, rather than the ones that are one-off acute injuries. Um, the lower back again, the most common site of injury, closely followed by the elbow and forearm and then the foot and ankle and then followed by the shoulder and the upper arm. And a total of 46.2% of these injuries were reportedly stained actually during the golf swing with those injuries most likely occurring at the point of impact, people feeling that. Well, that makes sense. Again, that's where you're obviously trying to deliver the greatest speed and the greatest force down to the golf ball. But also, when you think that's the, the point of impact with the ball, but potentially more importantly with the ground, if you're hitting into thick rough or heather or potentially shortly after impact up into the face of a bunker, then you're going to suddenly have a very rapid deceleration of the club and potentially a twisting of the club head, and that's going to be much more likely to cause uh, wrist and elbow related injuries. So that's part of the reason for that. And clearly, the amount of practice and play that people were involved with was relevant. So the more people practiced and played, clearly the more likely they were to experience injury. Um, interestingly enough also, how long they had their current set of golf clubs that they were using was also relevant. So if they weren't um, fitted to a set of clubs fairly recently, then they were actually more likely to experience an injury. So making sure that the clubs you're playing with are actually fitted to you as an individual can also be relevant according to this study. So why is back pain so common in golfers? Considering that over 28% of uh, golfers deal with back pain after every single round, and about 23% of players on the tour are currently playing with back pain. So it may not be the same golfers, but uh, yes, overall 
in terms of the prevalence at any one time, it's about 23% amongst the tall golfers. Well, it's important to remember the fact that the lower back and the pelvis is really the central point of the body. And many of the powerful muscles that run from the limbs actually come down and are centred down into the torso and the lower back. So the really powerful muscles from the shoulder run right the way down and then into the spine and attach down into the lower back. Equally, if we're looking at the hips and, and the legs, the powerful muscles, the gluteal muscles, run very close to the bottom of the back and the connective tissues are continuous in these structures. Um, and those con connective tissue linkages are actually very important and we're realising they're more and more important. We've effectively got these myofascial, these connective tissue slings that run across the body and they transcend beyond the uh, extremities of each individual muscle. So when anatomy is taught very often in the past, it's purely been taught in terms of here's a red muscle, it attaches here and here and it shortens this way to bring about movement in the joint. But actually, if you've stripped away the connective tissue that runs from several different muscles and potentially a long whole movement chains, then you're really then taking away your understanding of how movements are connected in the body and how certain muscle groups will work together. So that's very important. And, and we'll talk more about um, some of those things later on, some of those connective tissues. But going back to the lower back, it's certainly a point where forces can potentially be concentrated. The other thing to think about just in terms of the lower back is really if you ask many spinal experts and biomechanics experts, they'd say, well, there really haven't been all that many evolutionary adaptations to the spine uh, in humans as compared to those in apes who are walking around for much of the time on all fours, or they're swinging from trees, so their spines look remarkably similar. Okay, their, their pelvic uh, joints are a little bit different, the sacroiliac joints don't move quite as, as freely, well, ours move partially, theirs don't really move at all, so they walk very stiffly, but also their, their thigh angle is a little bit different, and that's partly what makes them inefficient upright walkers. But we walk upright all the time, so we've got a huge amount of compressive load going down through the spine. We've got the three curves of the spine which help to more evenly distribute the weight of the spine and that does help. But nonetheless, you've got this great long lever of the torso that we can potentially bring out in front of us to the side and rotate. And so an awful lot of strain can da go down through the lower back. Plus then, modern life. The back is actually not too bad if we're upright and walking and then sitting down for short periods of time. But unfortunately, these days we're all sitting down an awful lot in cars, in front of computers, etc. And you increase the loading on the lower back, you increase the loading on the lower lumbar discs. Particularly if you slouch, you can actually quadruple the load down in the lower lumbar discs if you're sat there for a period of time. So that's very important for those who have got a history of disc bulges. Posture really is important, and sitting for long periods of time is not a good thing. So if you're able to stand up and break up periods that you sat down, then that's very important. The other thing that's relevant to those people who suffer disc-related pain is it's important to remember there are diurnal changes to the pressure inside the discs. I'm going to talk more about the anatomy of the discs uh, in a few minutes' time. But during the course of a 24-hour period, the pressure inside these discs actually changes. So they've got a reasonably high water content, or at least they, they should do, particularly in early life. Um, each of these discs that sit between the vertebrae. And as we're standing upright, gravity is acting vertically downwards and compressing the spine. So you may have heard we all shrink slightly during the course of the day, and that's one of the main reasons for that. We're actually taller in the morning than we are in the evening because of that compression. And just a very small amount of fluid seeps out of each of these intervertebral discs. But that means when we lie still for five to eight hours, let's say overnight, the discs actually swell back up again. So when you first get up in the morning, you've got the perfect storm of conditions. You've got relatively swollen discs that are under greater pressure than they will be at any other time because they're slightly swollen in comparison to how they'll be a bit later on in the day. 
they've got a slightly higher water content, and this was um, uncovered by a professor over at the University of Bristol, actually back in 1981, a chap called Mike Adams, uh, and, and his research was validated by Stuart McGill's lab over in, uh, over in Canada, for those who are interested. Um, and uh, so the perfect storm is the fact that the discs are then slightly swollen, they're under slightly greater pressure, the muscles are stiff and cold, the core body temperature is reduced overnight, we've been still, and also the joints aren't moving very well because they haven't been moving. And a bit like circulating the oil in your car engine, you want to make sure you're circulating the fluid that lubricates the working and moving surfaces of your joints. And so that requires movement as well. So first thing in the morning, that hasn't happened for several hours. So the joints are very stiff. The stabilizing and supporting network, the hoop of muscles all around the spine that help to take some of the load potentially away from the spine and protect the spine in all the different ranges of movement it can uh, manage to achieve aren't all working desperately well. So for a lot of people uh, who experience back pain, first thing in the morning is the worst period of time for them. Just getting going in the morning can be really quite a challenge uh, and they then start to feel maybe a little bit better after an hour or so once the muscles are warmer, they've been loosened out. Um, the joints are moving better and those discs aren't quite so swollen. So that has very important ramifications for those who are thinking about doing certain kinds of physical training in the morning, but also it's hugely important as far as warm-ups for golfers are concerned. Absolutely for you as professionals, if I could give you just three things to take away, certainly one of them would be really to ingrain into all of your uh, clients and pupils, get them to warm up before they uh, go and play every time. Uh, because their body will be able to respond to the forces that they're going to put through um, it so much better. And they'll be able to coordinate the movement so much more effectively as well, because the body's systems will actually be moving smoothly, and they'll be able to take the joints through their optimal range, and the muscles should actually be working more effectively for them as well. So warm-ups are really important. So we're going to talk a bit more about spinal anatomy now. Um, so... As I alluded to earlier, we've got a, a spine that's made up of these vertebrae. So seven vertebrae in the cervical spine, the neck, 12 in the thoracic spine, and then five in the lumbar spine here, and then we've got the, the sacrum. So this is the back of the body, this is the front of the body. There's the triangular shaped sacrum there, and then the coccyx at the bottom. And then we've got the, the pelvic bones here that make these sacroiliac joints, which just allow for a very small amount of movement, so three or four millimetres max they help just as we're, we're walking and running, um, and also very slightly with a little bit of rotation as well, but only just a, a tiny, tiny fraction. So between those uh, vertebrae, we've obviously got the, the discs, those spongy pads that we were talking about, and we've also then got the, the nerves, really important in the spine. And the thing about the, the spinal nerves is, unfortunately, they don't actually have a huge space where they need to branch away from the spinal cord, so that runs centrally down the spine here. They don't have a huge amount of space between this archway at the back of bone, um, which, which forms the, the joints here, and the back of the discs. So if we get a disc that's bulging backwards, like this red one here, bulging backwards and often sideways, unfortunately, that's where the discs are most prone to injury and wear and tear. And that also happens to be, unfortunately, where the nerves exit to then, in the case of the lower back here, run into the, the pelvis to um, uh, supply the front of the leg in the top of the lumbar spine, and then down the side and the back of the leg lower down in the lumbar spine there. So um, the discs are most prone to, to being uh, injured and bulging in the lower part of the neck, but also the lower part of the back. So if someone's talking about a slipped or bulging disc, that's what they're referring to. Uh, one of these is the, like this little red area, the disc, the jelly-like material inside. It's very firm, thick, viscous jelly has actually been pushed backwards through these outer bark-like layers to potentially actually start to either chemically irritate the nerves or 
sometimes cause some overt compression. So you can get various degrees of that. You can get a little bit of a bulge um, or a bigger bulge, or you can actually get what's known as a herniation, where the jelly-like material actually gets fully pushed out um, towards the nerve or actually into the spinal canal. Um, and that obviously can create some pain. And very often people will talk about sciatica. Uh, that's pain uh, originating from the sciatic nerve, which just branches away. Um, the, these lower nerves form the sciatic nerve, and then it, it branches away. And the buttock here comes out of the sciatic notch, runs down the back of the leg to supply the lower part of the leg. But if it's being pinched, the origin of that nerve is being pinched, and the nerve roots are being affected, then people get an electric shock-like shooting pain all the way down the leg, usually the back or the side of the leg, potentially into the foot. And uh, then they find that any relatively small movements often of their back can be extremely painful. The other thing that we can get, and we'll talk a bit more about this, is wear and tear in the back. So osteoarthritis, wear and tear arthritis. Arthritis basically is where the... Uh, cartilage that overlies the, the joint surfaces, that the cartilage allows the joints to freely glide and move across uh, each other so that the joints can move smoothly. Those cartilaginous surfaces can get worn and broken up slightly and then uh, you can get a stiffness that really occurs. The other thing is those joints can actually start to overgrow. So if you're putting repeated pressure through the joints in certain areas, the body responds to that and it actually lays down more bone because it's thinking, well, lots of pressures, but it's not thinking, but its adaptation is because there's been more pressure exerted in that area, it'll lay down more bone to try and compensate for that. The difficulty is that tends to make the joints at the back, the facet joints, spread slightly. And unfortunately then, they tend to spread forwards often. So then you can have the worst case scenario, potentially of a disc that's bulging from front to back, and then you've got joints that are overgrowing slightly and starting to impinge the nerve roots from the back towards the front. And so that can cause some crowding of the nerves, um, and, and that's commonly termed stenosis. So you can get that uh, at the point where the nerves branch outwards, lateral recess stenosis or you can get what's known as central stenosis or canal stenosis where the nerves are actually being crowded inside um, the, the, the canal of the, the spine here before they branch away to run down the leg. And that tends to create certain characteristic symptoms so people will tend to be very stiff with that. Um, it presents slightly differently. These people tend to have a very long history of back pain and lots of, of problems over years. It's usually a very protracted history. So if you've got clients that you're teaching who have talked about a long history of lower back pain and having had problems, and then they're starting to get nerve-related symptoms, then it, it could be something related to um, stenosis there. So obviously, we're not expecting pros to be diagnosing pain or problems, and, and the PGA would want me to explain that that's, that's clearly not something... Um, that they want you to be doing and you're not insured for that but it's useful to know what's going on inside someone's body because it's going to give you a bit of a, an indication as to how they're going to move and potentially why some of the compensating movement patterns might play in, in all of these different areas. So I think that covers most of the uh, basic spinal anatomy from uh, the point of view of the bones, um, the joints, the nerves and the discs. What we'll come on to now a bit more over muscles. So on the screen here, I'm sorry for those who are viewing in online, we're talking about the, the spinal anatomy of all the muscles. Um, I'll try and demonstrate a little bit on myself here. Um, but what we can see on the screen here are really all the big superficial muscles um, of the, the back and of the spine. So we've got the diamond sort of shaped trapezius muscles that run down the, from the, the, the base of the skull down the back. We've then got these huge muscles here, the latissimus dorsi, which aid movements of the arms and stabilize the back. They attach onto the arms, but they also anchor right down into the base of the back here, uh, into the thoracolumbar fascia and down um, into the pelvis and the sacrum. Huge, really powerful muscles. Anyone that's done lap pull down in the gym, those are the muscles that you're predominantly working. 
um, but a very important stabiliser of the back as well. And you can see all of the different shoulder muscles um, and, and how they're attaching towards the spine as well from there. We'll go a layer deeper now, so imagine that we've peeled away those superficial muscles and we'll look at the deep spinal muscles now. So we've still got some very powerful muscles, the, the erector spiny muscles they're commonly termed, that sit just underneath this layer. So the iliocostalis and longissimus muscles, doesn't matter about the names, but they're the ones that basically hold us in the upright position, position, keep the spine upright. And of course, when you're standing over the golf ball and dressing the golf ball, they're starting to activate because you're translating the weight of the torso out in front of the hips like this. And so they're pulling and holding you upright, otherwise your body would just collapse forwards that way. So for people who start to feel aching and stiffness if they've been practicing their putting for a long period of time, well, that's your body saying you need to take a break, stand up, have a stretch, move about. Those muscles are having to, to pull like guy wires of a tent to keep your spine in the upright position. And they're getting tired. They're just simply not designed to hold you in that position for that length of time. So you should stand up, have a break, stretch off, move about, walk about for a minute. They'll quickly reset themselves again and you'll be able to carry on. But if you ignore that, then you're more likely to aggravate any back symptoms that you do have. Or if you don't have them, you're more likely to create back problems. So certainly worth bearing those things in mind. Just for completeness, you can also see on the left side of the diagram here some very small muscles. It doesn't really matter about the, the names, the, the multifidy, the rotatories, etc. Those are basically very small segmental muscles. Now, some of them, uh, it seems, help with some degree of stabilization of individual joints, but they're also actually really important in terms of giving us uh, positional feedback in the spine. So there's a lot of information that the brain processes out and we're not consciously aware of, but is still involved in coordinating all of our movements, so we don't necessarily consciously think about how we move, because um, these movement patterns have been very much ingrained since we were young children. But needless to say, these muscles are actually acting as little position sensors just to tell you, oh well, L3 and L4 are in this position, L2 and L1 are in this position, etc. So it's constantly relaying feedback, and, and those small segmental muscles are actually quite important from that point of view. Sometimes in, in uh, situations of injury, they can actually get very cramped up and very tight as well as the really big, powerful muscles, but um, uh, we won't go into more detail on that. So as we said, the back and neck, very common injuries um, in golfers and in, in the human body in general. I want to talk a little bit just about the, the terminology of injury because sometimes it can get a bit confusing. You know, we talk about a strain and a sprain and a bulging disc, etc. You know, what do all of these things mean? Well, we've talked a little bit about those disc injuries. In terms of strains, what we're referring to are muscles. And we're talking really about muscles being taken beyond their normal length. So that's either overstretching or it's too much contraction. So if you look at muscle under a microscope, you've got these little filaments that basically sit like that, a bit like teeth in a zip, and they will slide across one another to create tension. They'll shorten, and they lie in three dimensions, many hundreds of thousands of them, to make up the whole belly of a muscle. So they will then contract when given the relevant nerve stimulation, and they shorten, and those teeth will then slide across one another to shorten the muscle. But... If you really violently contract the muscles, then you can end up over-contracting them, and you lose that nice uniform structure of these little sarcomeres, these little subunits, um, and, and that can create pain and inflammation um, and irritation, and then you get stiffness and discomfort from that. Equally, if you overstretch the, the muscle for any particular reason, you know, we've all done that, reaching for something or, uh, yes, suddenly going into a sprint perhaps when we, we hadn't got warmed up and we suddenly strain a calf muscle. Um, that can be due to a contraction, but equally it can also be due in certain areas to a, a muscle suddenly being overstretched. And then again you can get the, the pain and the discomfort from that. I'll talk a little bit more about how long those things usually take to heal up and settle down. Um, 
But uh, yes, the good thing about muscle injuries is they're usually relatively short term as long as they're not really very big and very severe. Sprains, sprains usually refer to ligaments. So ligaments hold bones together and you can, you can sprain those. So the classic one, a sprained ankle, rolling over on your ankle, you end up stretching the ligaments out, the ligaments that hold the bones of the ankle together and then you get pain and problems from that, very often swelling as well. Or you can sprain the joints in the spine, so those facet joints, if you overstretch them suddenly, you know, you're trying to really rotate in your backswing perhaps, and then you suddenly overstretch things and you can get some pain from that. You can also strain, uh, sorry, you can also sprain your sacroiliac joints, so they rely on uh, a network of very strong ligaments to hold them in place. Uh, huge forces coming up through the leg into the pelvis and they can also be sprained as well. So really what you're talking about is an overstretching of the ligaments and potentially the joint capsule as well when you're talking about a sprain injury. We talked a bit about discs, so the only thing we didn't really discuss there is a, a delaminating uh, or cracked disc. What we're really referring to there is if you imagine the disc is a little bit like the layers of an onion, uh, it's an outer sort of bark-like layer, tough fibrous layer, and that can actually start to um, unpeel. That's really what, what we mean by delaminating, and you get a, a crack that can form, and then when the disc is compressed in certain positions, or twisting loads go through the disc, we can get pain from that. We have a question? A question from Syed Ali. Um, how do you correct a pelvic tilt and get rid of lower back pain? Correcting a pelvic tilt. Well, there's a certain amount of conjecture about pelvic tilt. So what Saeed's talking about here um, is an unleveling of these bones here. So these are the iliac crests, um, and potentially one can appear higher than the other. Now, there are various reasons for that, and different experts and different opinions will tell you different things on this. It appears that if someone has a significantly longer leg on one side, that can obviously then unlevel the pelvis. So from a structural standpoint, then that's a difficult one side. Um, what you can do though, if that were the case, and we're talking about at least an inch and a half really, um, before the, there's a, a, a likely relationship between the difference in leg length one side to the other being the likely cause of your back pain, you can put uh, an inner sole in the shoe and a bit of a heel lift, that can level things out then because the legs are effectively at a more similar height inside the shoe. Unleveling of the pelvis also can seem to be the case if you have what's known as a scoliosis. So if the spine is twisted like this, okay, so instead of the spine, if you're looking at it um, from the back to the front, it should be fairly straight down this way, like that. But if it starts to deviate laterally, like this, that's what we call a scoliosis. And that can also end up leading to some unleveling in the pelvis. So really, there are some structural things like that that you can't directly change. However, if you've got areas that are very tight on one side and potentially very weak on the other, you can try and correct the muscle balance so that at least the lower back and pelvis is held in a neutral position and you're doing so on both sides and so really what you want to do is to make sure that the sacroiliac joints and your hip joints are moving freely and comfortably on both sides, those aren't sources of pain, if they are you want to probably see a chiropractor, osteopath, physiotherapist about that. They may need to do some hands-on manual therapy treatments on those areas, but also it's very important for you as a golfer that you do the relevant stabilization exercises and that will help to level things out. So uh, there's no point in just having hands-on treatment really if you're going to be putting regular loads through your back as you will as a golfer, you want to be making sure that you're doing the relevant strengthening exercises to make sure your body's as symmetrical as possible, and then that should help with the unleveling of your pelvis. So that's not an entirely uh, exhaustive answer to your question, but hopefully at least that gives you some indication of what we're talking about there.
Any questions in the room about that? I'm happy with all that. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we'll move on from there, talking a bit more about uh, some of the, the common injury terms and terminology. Arthritis, we talked about the wear and tear in the cartilage. Obviously, that's something that tends to occur later on in life. There is a genetic element to that as well. You'll see there's a family history um, that people have. So unfortunately, if your parents have got wear and tear arthritis, it does tend to make you more prone to having it. And so, you know, you might be aware that hip replacements and knee replacements and things can tend to run in families because of that. Um, the other thing is that trauma can have a bearing on how much wear and tear arthritis people tend to develop. Um, if you've had a significant trauma to a particular area of your body, let's say it's the knee and you've had a, an anterior cruciate ligament injury, so common footballing injury, um, sliding tackles will, will very often do that. It will uh, then cause the, the, the cruciate ligaments that hold the thigh bone and the uh, shin bone in position. Uh, these cross-shaped ligaments basically make sure there isn't too much shearing force so that the joint doesn't move too much this way and that, forwards and backwards. That can be either torn partially or fully, um, and you can potentially tear the cartilage in the knee. Let's say that's happened to someone playing football age 25. By the time they're 50, they've been walking around on that, um, uh, it, assuming they didn't have surgery on it. Um, and uh, that they will have been walking on that without it being uh, corrected, uh, they will have unquestionably adapted to that change in the mechanics in their knee, and they will be more likely to experience wear and tear as a result. So that would something obviously be to, to be aware of if you're coaching somebody. Um, you know, if they've had a history of, of problems in the knee or the ankle or the hip, some trauma there, and they tend to feel stiffness and aches and pains, um, it may very well explain why they swing the club in the way that they do, because the body's very good at trying to compensate and avoid painful habits and movement patterns. Moving on, I talked a little bit uh, self-indulgently for a moment at the beginning about the back injury that I had. Uh, this is very common, actually, in young athletes of, of various kinds. So... Um, this stress fracture I was referring to, the spondylolisthesis, um, is basically where anything spondy refers to a vertebrae, by the way, and listhesis means sliding, sliding forwards usually. You can get retrolisthesis, sliding backwards, but usually it's sliding forwards. So what can happen? We believe there's a genetic predisposition for this bit of weakness in this archway of bone, um, the pars, um, it's called, and you can get then a pars defect. Um, from repeated stresses and strains, so extension loading and rotation in particular, so gymnasts, fast bowlers, golfers, squash players, tennis players, um, divers, high prevalence of that particular injury, tends to manifest in teenage years, adolescence. Not all of them, it has to be said, are symptomatic, and there's thought to be quite a high prevalence of sacroiliac joint pain in these individuals because they're stressing those joints, and so you might end up actually seeing one of these uh, spondylolisthesis, a little bit of slipping forward of, of, usually it's this vertebrae, the L5, on an x-ray when you look from the sideways view. Um, but that may actually be a sort of an artifact, really, um, and you might assume because there's a structural abnormality there that that's the source of the pain, but it may not necessarily be. So when they've done studies and injected local anaesthetic into various areas to try and find out where the pain's coming from, um, it, it hasn't actually always been the stress fracture that's been the cause of the problem. These days you can get something called a SPECT scan, where you're actually looking at the activity inside the bone, and you're looking at how rapidly the bone is turning over, how metabolically active the tissue is in a certain area, and you can infer from that whether the body's trying to heal up that area. And then you're, you're getting closer to whether that's likely to be a source of pain or not, because um, if the body's trying to heal it up um, and it's doing so very vigorously, then clearly there's ongoing stresses there and it's, it's causing problems. Another question? Um, sorry, again. Um, he has a friend who's having an ACL reconstruction on his left knee. Uh, he's a right-handed golfer. How soon can he return to playing golf if he keeps up with, a thorough, uh, with, with thorough physiotherapy? 
Right, well, the answer on that one is it depends. Uh, you need to be in discussion with the surgeon doing the operation in that situation and keep in touch with them. So you want to have then find, found out how well the operation has gone um, and then uh, get the surgeon's advice, explain how the rehabilitation process has been going and the, the physiotherapist who's the expert in dealing with the rehabilitation of that injury will obviously be able to give you a good indication of that, but I think then uh, once you've completed the rehabilitation program, it would be good to speak to your own healthcare team who have been dealing with you, so the surgeon and the physio, um, and saying, am I now safe to go back to golf? That's likely to be probably three months later. Um, depends uh, a little bit, but that sort of time scale, it's not a quick fix, I'm afraid. So uh, when you're talking about going back to really hitting full shots and drives and things like that, it's, it's a case of, of months of, of rehabilitation before you're really back again. Um, so it, it does take quite a period of time and, and it does depend on, on individual circumstances as well. So hopefully that answers that question. Moving on to the spine, we talked a little bit about the spinal stenosis, the crowding of the nerves, so I'm not going to carry on too much about that. The only thing is to say that that tends to occur again later in life. So that, that often uh, coincides with <coughs> excuse me, wear and tear or osteoarthritis. Well, let's come on to the upper limb injuries now, so the shoulder, elbow and wrist. So we talked a bit about straining muscles um, and that can be acute in the case of the elbow and the wrist when we were explaining hitting out of rough or heavy, you can obviously end up uh, spraining ligaments both in the wrist but also in the elbow um, and you can also do so rather than acute traumatic injuries like I was describing you can also have the repetitive strain of hitting lots and lots of golf balls the impact with the ground also very relevant to people who hit lots of balls at the driving range on a mat because there tends to be uh, uh, the mats generally are better but some of them particularly the older ones actually don't necessarily have much spring, much sponginess left in them and if you've got a concrete surface underneath and you're pounding uh, loads and loads of golf balls that's a potential issue so uh, bear that in mind. Or if you're a really steep swinger and a deep divot taker if you're hitting lots of short irons then potentially that's putting more stress on those areas as well. So in the shoulder, um, spraining the joint there the AC joint, the acromioclavicular joints, a very commonly sprained joint. This basically allows you to bring your arm up, right up above your head, but also around you this way. Okay, so quite relevant to a golfer trying to do this sort of action. If you've sprained your AC joint, you've stretched the ligaments that hold the collarbone onto the other piece of bone, the acromion bit of the, the, the shoulder blade, the scapula that comes forward, then... Um, that can be stretched and, and that can be painful. Also very common for people falling over, uh, fall on an stretched hand off a bike or something like that, motor, motorcycle injuries, etc. Um, but that can mean um, people really struggle with certain kinds of movements and then they can be more prone again to, to wear and tear arthritis. They may not be able to also fully externally rotate then in that shoulder as well. So getting the club into a good position at the top of the backswing may be quite difficult for them. Um, so again, having that history and that information can be very useful. In terms of uh, shoulders, poor mechanics again, over the laptop, over the computer, driving, that doesn't help. You're then uh, placing the shoulder in a position where the tendons that have to run through a bony archway to attach onto the front of the arm bone, those tendons then are more likely to get compressed or impinged as we call it. So you may have heard of the rotator cuff. It's a collection of muscles that basically stabilizes and supports the shoulder. The shoulder is an extremely mobile joint, but it sacrifices stability because of that. So we've got a very shallow socket that the upper arm bone sits in. Uh, and then we've got a little bit of cartilage called the glenoid labrum, which helps to just deepen the capsule a little bit, make the joint a little bit more stable. But we really rely on the balance of all of those muscles, those rotator cuff muscles. So if they're not working well and our sh lower shoulder blade stabilization is poor, 
then the shoulder tends to come upwards and forwards, and the space that these poor tendons have to pass underneath the bony archway to attach onto the front of the arm bone becomes reduced, and so people can start to get uh, rotator cuff tendon problems, so tendinopathy or sometimes termed tendonitis. Um, and then they'll usually have problems raising the arm out to the side, difficulty bringing the arm behind the back, movements out in front of them, this way, um, putting coats on, all those sorts of things are going to be quite difficult for them. Lying on the shoulder is also going to be difficult as well. So the shoulder, really, really important. This is something I look at quite a lot when I'm uh, assessing someone's biomechanics, particularly if they're struggling to, to rotate and move well and get the club into a consistently good backswing position. So we'll look at the shoulder quite a lot um, because it is very relevant. And, and if someone's saying, oh, well, my coach is trying to get me into this position, then I can just about do it statically. But when I try and do it in the golf swing, I just can't consistently get there. Um, we'll, we'll look at potentially why that is. And, and very often the shoulder has a role to play in that. Um, so it's really important that people get set into a good posture here and that they're engaging the relevant muscles here. So unfortunately, with day-to-day -day modern lives, these upper muscles tend to get very tightened and shortened, and the shoulder blade will tend to tip forwards a bit. We tend not to use the lower shoulder blade stabilizing muscles well enough to hold the shoulder blade back and down close to the rib cage. That gives optimal clearance. And if you want to have a graphic um, explanation of this for a client, how uh, posture is important, I always show them this way. So if you get, you can stand up, guys, maybe and just try this for yourself now. If you hunch over like this, I want you to raise your arms up as far as you possibly can. So really round your back and stoop over like that. And then try and raise your arms up as high as you possibly can. You feel the restriction there? That gets really difficult. If you then bring yourself into the upright position, you drop your shoulders back and down, nice and upright, lengthen there, and then swing your arms up. You've then got the optimal clearance and you should be able to comfortably bring your arms up over your head equally. If you want to go behind your back here, you can do that and stretch back this way to get back into a good backswing position. So if you've set your pelvis and your lower back angles and your thoracic spine in a good position, your shoulders are just drawn back and down, then you can make that optimal turn and get your shoulder into a really good position. So posture is really important. If you can, we know that obviously, and, and you are all experts as golf professionals in analyzing and assessing movement patterns and posture, but from a biomechanical standpoint, that's why getting into that posture is so important if you're going to consistently make a good, efficient golf swing and a good movement pattern there. So as I discussed, the fact that the uh, shoulder joint is, is very shallow, unfortunately it's quite prone to laxity, and some individuals, particularly some families, tend to have a history of lax ligaments, so the ligaments are a bit more stretchy, a bit more pliable, uh, and, and just a little bit longer. So the shoulder, not having a very deep cup for the upper arm bone to sit in, is quite prone to dislocation. So you might have heard of unfortunate people having anterior dislocations of the shoulder, where the shoulder actually pops out. Really painful, horrible thing to happen, um, and unfortunately people can recurrently suffer from that problem. Uh, and of course the more it happens, the more the joint capsule tends to get stretched and the more the uh, ligaments obviously get stretched. So you want to make sure in those individuals that they've really got very good stabilization of all of those rotator cuff muscles, the balance of all of the different muscles across the shoulder um, are as good as possible. Uh, and some of those individuals do end up needing to have surgery just to stabilize that, that shoulder in that situation and, and then the ongoing rehabilitation from there. So again, shoulders quite prone because of all the stresses that go on through the shoulder and all the different movements that we have, quite prone to wear and tear arthritis. And so uh, some of your peoples and clients may talk about having stiffness in their shoulder, maybe some graunching and grinding sometimes in the shoulder, um, and, and not being able to, to bring the arm right back into the position that they need. So then obviously um, you may have to work with in the realms of what they can physically do there um, because you can't directly reverse that uh, un 
unfortunately the, the cartilage has been worn, the damage has already been done up to a certain point, so you, you're just looking at managing those symptoms and making sure that you can optimise the movement mechanics as well as possible in that situation. So you can get a cartilage tear, a, a labral tear in, in various areas, um, so that can, that can happen in the, in, the, in the wrist, it can happen, a cartilage tear also in the, in the hip um, and in the, in the shoulder as well. Um, in terms of the, the wrist, the wrist is actually um, quite a, a complex joint, got seven bones that make up the, the carpals in the wrist and we'll, we'll come on to that in just a moment and some cartilage that stabilises um, those small bones in the wrist um, and stabilises the, the far end of the, the arm bones here. But if you think about the forces going through the wrist, when you hit a golf ball and you suddenly then have a very rapid deceleration through rough or heather, there are tremendous loads going through the, the wrist and, uh, and obviously that can lead to problems and also just the fact that if you're hitting balls regularly of course you've got the the wear and tear, the overuse style issues there. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So here's just a picture of the shoulder. Uh, for those online, we're just showing a picture of the shoulder joint anatomy. So you can see it's a relatively shallow capsule that's formed by the shoulder blade here. So looking at the shoulder blade around here, and then the upper arm bone humerus that sits in this shallow capsule. Uh, and then there's the collarbone reaching out across there, and then the, uh, the little chromium here that forms that so-called AC joint there. Okay, and then this is the, the piece that uh, the biceps muscle, the short head of the biceps actually attaches onto the, the front just there. And then these rotator cuff tendons, they slide down and just attach onto the front of the arm bone here. So they, they anchor just there. So often people with those rotator cuff problems will get pain in the front of the shoulder here and then that can radiate down the arm a bit, often down towards the elbow. So we can see all the different muscles that I was talking about there, and the real need for the st uh, stabilisation and the balance of all of those. So we've got these big powerful muscles that run up from the shoulder right up into the neck and the head, that elevate the shoulder. We've got muscles that stabilise the shoulder from the, the inside of the shoulder blade here onto the spine. We've got muscles that pull the shoulder blade back and down and in towards the spine, lower down the, the lower trapezius there, and we've also got muscles that help to stabilise the shoulder blade down into the rib cage. So um, there are an awful lot of muscles that are very much involved in stabilising the shoulder blade in the correct position. And then we've obviously got muscles like the, the deltoid, the big powerful muscles that um, you often see on, on people who do lots of weight training and when you're doing uh, various overhead lifts and flies and things like that, um, you're going to be training that area. The other thing that's very relevant to the shoulder, the pectoralis muscles, the chest muscles, because if they're too tight from working postures, driving postures, and then we go into the gym and we start doing pec deck and bench press and flies, um, we're going to be tightening those muscles up even more. So it might give you a slightly better beach body, but in terms of trying to swing a golf club, forget about it you're going to really have problems there and you'll end up being muscle bound and forward drawn like this and not being able to swing the club very well. So um, it's very important if you're thinking about physical training for golf, you want to make sure that the exercises you're doing are specifically related to you, any injuries that you have, what you're trying to work on in your golf swing, whether you're someone who lacks balance, lacks flexibility, lacks strength, you want to be working on trying to increase those areas of weakness you might lack, muscular endurance in the core muscles, etc. Make sure you're training all of those relevant areas. So your training really needs to be balanced to keep you pain free, but also if you're a keen golfer and you want to improve your golf and that's part of your motivation for exercising, then do make sure that you're trying to balance things out. That's very, very important. So this is a bit of a close-up of the shoulder now. You can see what I'm talking about here. This is one of the rotator cuff muscles commonly injured, the supraspinatus. It's the muscle that pulls the arm out and the shoulder out to the side like that. It's got this just very narrow space through which the tendons have to pass underneath this bony archway to then attach onto the front of the arm bone. 
and then the infraspinatus, this is the spine of the scapula here, the, the bony bit that you feel at the back there on the shoulder blade. And this muscle is involved in turning the arm outwards like this. Again, very narrow space through which that poor tendon has to pass to attach onto the front of the arm bone. Another question. Question from Charlie. Um, in the golf swing, is it more stable to keep the shoulders down and back throughout so you find it causes tension? Okay, Charlie. Well, um, I think it's important that you get your shoulders set into a good position. So relatively back and down is the feeling that you might want in your shoulder blades at setup. But then I certainly don't think you want to consciously feel like you're drawing your shoulder blades down like this as you're trying to turn because that's going to actually make it more difficult for you to, to rotate um, because the, the shoulders are actually doing different things. So your right shoulder is externally rotating and abducting away from you when you're going to the top of the backswing as a right-handed golfer, whilst you've got a huge amount of horizontal adduction going across your chest in the left arm. So the, the shoulders are actually doing the, the opposite movements one to the other, so that there can't be the same activation in the muscles both sides, otherwise you wouldn't be able to, to move in the relevant way. So um, I think certainly feeling that you're, you're nicely set in a good position with the shoulders back and down from there, but then after that you just want to feel about nice relaxed shoulders and, and letting yourself turn, so let your shoulders and your thoracic spine turn and coil. Um, so you, you may need to work on uh, a little bit of mobility around your shoulders and a little bit of stabilisation off the golf course, but when you're over the golf ball, I wouldn't be trying to think about tensing up certain muscles. I mean, uh, that could get very complicated indeed. Um, so, no, I don't think you want to think about those things. Okay. So moving on from there, a little bit more uh, detail about the, the shoulder here. Again, you can just see the socket in which the... Uh, arm bone sits and there's this structure here called a bursa that's just a friction reducing structure basically we've got lots of tendons and ligaments around the shoulder and that helps the joint surfaces just to glide free and or helps the the tendons around the joints to, to glide and, and move smoothly over one another but that's one of the soft tissue structures that very commonly gets inflamed when we have a shoulder problem um, so the, the subacromial subdeltoid bursa can get inflamed and so that's often an area where a steroid injection uh, can be located in order to help the soft tissues inside the shoulder just settle down to give those tendons a little bit more space. And so uh, when someone has a steroid injection, that's one of the structures that's often uh, inflamed and, and the injection can help just to calm that down. So it's not curative and you want to address the underlying joint mechanics in that situation. Um, Steroid injections can be very effective and very helpful, particularly for shoulders, and can give you a really good window of opportunity then to start working on the rehabilitation. But you want to remember that there's probably a biomechanical reason as to why that injury came about in the first place. So trying to get to the root cause of that and trying to uh, get things balanced out from there can be very important. And certainly as far as golfers and athletes are concerned, that's, that's, that's critical. So uh, that's again just showing that potential pinching point for those tendons in the shoulder. So let's move on to the elbow now. I'm not going to talk exhaustively about the elbow. Obviously we know the elbow flexes and extends like this. Uh, so we can, we can flex to about 160 degrees there and then extend all the way out. We can also rotate from the elbow here. So the pronation supination movement okay, occurs largely um, around the, the radial head here and pivoting around that part of the elbow there. So uh, that's very important, obviously, in the, in the golf swing. I have seen a couple of cases where people have got anatomically very stiff and restricted uh, movement in their uh, radial head. They can't supinate all that well. Or people that are constantly 10 hours a day on a mouse like this um, actually they end up getting very stiff in some of the muscles from being in this position all the time. So uh, they need to, to work on just um, actually uh, getting the, the wrist to open out a little bit more this way and there are certain exercises that you can do. But obviously if you can't then uh, fully supinate here, 
you, you may not be getting the club into the best possible position there, so you might then be struggling and, and finding that the club's going across the line there. Um, uh, so so that, that can be relevant in terms of where the elbow position is. So I'm not changing the position of my wrist here. You can see I'm just supinating and pronating there. So if someone can't go all the way around, by the time the shoulder's back here, that may have an impact on the, on the club as well. So it's um, relatively unusual, but it's just worth knowing uh, whether someone does have a restriction there. So you might just want them to, to turn the club like this and just see, or even just turn their hand and see where their thumb moves and how much movement that they have there, like that. In terms of injuries in the shoulder and problems, I'm really only going to talk about a couple of issues in the elbow. Uh, now, they're collectively termed golfers and tennis elbow. Doesn't mean you have to necessarily be a golfer or necessarily be a tennis player to experience these things, though, um, but it's just more common in those groups. So in terms of golfer's elbow, what we're talking about here are the flexors of the wrist and the forearm here so they pull the wrist up like this those muscles run down and attach onto the inside of the elbow the, the medial epicondyle it's called and so those forearm muscles pulling up like this you can see they run down there and attach there several of them quite powerful muscles but they all have this common point of attachment so if you're using those muscles an awful lot and, and they're being worked all the time, they're pulling very hard on that tendon attachment point. And you can start to get some uh, wear and tear in the tendon itself. So it can have the appearance under a microscope of almost a frayed rope sort of appearance. So the nice uniform structure in the tendon is lost. Um, there's a lot of discussion in the healthcare world about whether it's tendonitis or tendinopathy. Um, that's basically referring to inflammation. So we know that there's wear and tear in the tendons. Sometimes there can be some inflammation in the surrounding soft tissues. Usually there's not actually uh, much in the way of inflammation in the tendon itself. It doesn't really matter that much. The bottom line is as far as uh, us golfers are concerned, you know, there's a painful problem uh, in the elbow here when someone's gripping and grasping the club and they've got pain here, what they need to do about that uh, is varied according to how severe it is, but by and large we want to try and reduce the tension in those muscles um, and slowly stretch them back out to more normal resting length again and also gently encourage the muscles and the tendon to accept more loading again. So we can do that with very light resistance, with therabands or a very light weight and just doing very low repetition style exercises, um, oh, sorry, very low weight with relatively high repetitions, just to gently uh, get the, the right sort of loading patterns back through the tendon and actually stimulates the tendon to heal back up again. So uh, very often talk about what's known as eccentric loading in this situation. All that's referring to is the fact that the muscle is lengthening whilst it's under tension. So if you think about me, um, pulling a band up that I'm standing on and I pull it up like this as the muscle then releases and my elbow lengthens back out and those wrist muscles going from this position to that position start to lengthen out they're still maintaining the tension otherwise the band would just suddenly snap back down again so they're still under tension the muscles here but they're lengthening back out again and it's that eccentric phase of the muscle contraction that seems to be important in putting the right level of gentle loading through the tendon, and that stimulates the tendon to heal up. The problem with tendons is they have a very poor blood supply, so if you're doing things that constantly tend to break them down and cause wear and tear, uh, then um, because the, the healing rate is poor and slow because of that poor blood supply, things take a very long time. Tennis elbow, the reverse. It's the same problem in the tendons. Um, these tendons, though, this time attach onto the outside of the elbow just here. When you pull the wrist up like this, okay, you can feel those uh, muscles working and perhaps feel it on the attachment point just here. And uh, people tend to get pain, obviously, most commonly in, in racket sports players, this occurs, but <coughs> reasonably common in golfers as well, actually. It does happen in golfers too. Um, so those, those wrist muscles. Um, 
obviously you have to work hard pulling the wrist up this way and uh, you can get some aggravation to the tendon attachment point just there. So those both wrist compartments are actually working quite hard, the muscles are working quite hard during the course of the golf swing at different phases, but um, it's a repetitive strain injury essentially um, that's causing a problem to the tendons there and a gradual breakdown and an irritation to those structures until the normal loading patterns in the golf swing start to cause pain and problems. So the wrist, this is what I was talking about, those little bones inside the wrist, okay, they allow the various movements that we have in the wrist up, down, side to side, some rotation and swinging as well in, in the wrist this way. I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but basically as we said, ligaments attach bones and hold them together, and because of the strains in the golf swing, and particularly the sudden deceleration of hitting the ground, hitting heather, hitting rough, we can end up stretching and, and spraining those ligaments. We can also end up causing damage to this little piece of cartilage here, just a very small area, the triangular fibre cartilage, but uh, certainly a problem for golfers. So you can see the little bones around the diagram here, um, and it's the, the ligaments that hold the scaphoid and the lunate together, and then the lunate and the triquetrum here, um, those ligaments are the ones that are most commonly sprained in, in golf. Um, and uh, then we've got the, the little piece of cartilage that basically helps to, to stabilise the wrist um, that sits in there, and that can get sometimes torn um, and cause pain and problems, and potentially a bit of swelling as well. Uh, there are other uh, issues involved um, in the wrist. By no means this is an exhaustive uh, uh, set of issues. You can get uh, tendons subluxing and uh, uh, all sorts of uh, different pains and problems in the wrist. Um, around the base of the thumb here, that's very prone to arthritis. So if you're going to get wear and tear arthritis that generally occurs in that area, because obviously the thumb is so important to all sorts of things that we're doing in terms of gripping and grasping. That's that triangular fibre cartilage I was just talking about, so stabilising the distal ulna and, and the carpus there, the, the, uh, the, the little bones inside the, uh, the wrist, so um, very important, but if someone's getting pain in that area, uh, it's certainly worth getting them uh, to, to have that looked at if it's, if it's something that isn't going away and, uh, and, and they're having persistent problems with, because it is uh, an important stabiliser and shock absorber of the wrist. Um, and, and golfers' wrists do take quite a hammering sometimes. So this is just for a bit of uh, interest. This is potentially how that uh, bit of cartilage can be surgically repaired. So just uh, shaving off a bit of the tear in the cartilage and, uh, and then just cleaning out the joint a little bit potentially as well. Um, I'm, I'm no expert on that. Uh, consulting a, a surgeon is the answer um, if, if surgery is looking likely as far as the wrist is concerned. We'll move on to the ankle. So the ankle um, its actually the most commonly injured joint in the body as far as sport in general is concerned. So if we're thinking about football, rugby, uh, tennis, basketball, etc., rolling over on the ankle is really common. So quite a complex joint. As you can see, you've got the two big bones running down. So the tibia is the main shin bone, and then the outside bone, the fibula. You can see that the fibula runs down below the level of the tibia, and that's actually partly why the ankle isn't always that stable when we're um, moving the, the foot and pressure is placed then on the outside of the foot. We're more likely to roll over onto the outside of the ankle. The other thing is, unfortunately, the ligaments aren't quite so strong on the outside. We've got really strong ligaments, the deltoid ligaments on the inside of the ankle. On the outside, the ligaments aren't quite so strong. So the anterior talar fibula ligament, it's called, that runs down here, um, that one is the most commonly injured in, uh, in the ankle. And what happens basically, if you hear about people going over on their ankle, they're doing that, it's called an inversion sprain. That just refers to the inside side por portion of the foot, the sole of the foot going inwards that way and the foot rolling over like that. So those ligaments then get stretched on the lower outside of the ankle. That causes bruising and, and pain and, and swelling and uh, 
then weight bearing is obviously a problem. People struggle to walk around on that. And when you think about how much activity is going on inside the right ankle for a, a right-handed golfer, there's obviously an awful lot of movement there. Not so much on the backswing, but as we start to roll across this way, clearly there's a lot of stress going down through the foot and the ankle and rotating over like this. So certainly you may well have come across um, clients who have difficulty with their ankles and don't have much movement in their ankles and that can certainly have an impact on the way that they swing the club and they'll tend to have uh, movement pattern uh, deficits or changes higher up the movement chain potentially. Um, the other thing that's quite often looked at is um, the amount that you can lean forwards into the ankle joint like this so uh, the, 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 the dorsiflexion, the relative amount that you can pull the foot up relative to the, the shin bone here because obviously if you're going to be getting into a good position here if you can't flex at the ankle joint then you're going to potentially be trying to compensate elsewhere and your stability your connection with the ground isn't going to be so good so generally sprained ankles do recover reasonably well as, not, as long as they're not really severe and I'll talk a little bit more about this in just a moment those stretched ligaments, what's really happening is if you look microscopically, there are these little crimps, almost um, like little zigzags in the uh, microstructure of the, the ligaments and they get pulled out and stretched. The li ligament literally becomes a bit, a bit longer and a bit lax and it takes a long time for the fibres to all um, uh, get reorientated back into their appropriate strength and position. Uh, so that you have the, the normal uh, tensile strength in the, the ligament again and, and uh, less laxity in the joint. So um, unfortunately that, that can be a problem in, in ankles. But very often people can get 95-ish percent of the way there, they get pain-free, they're able to, to go back to sport and things, but they don't realise that they have lingering deficits on that side. So. Um, that's something that we quite often pick up when we test people's balance because um, if they haven't fully rehabilitated the ankle they'll still end up having far worse balance on that side and they may not necessarily be aware of that um, but then you ask them, oh have you ever sprained that ankle and say, oh actually yeah, you know, I did five, ten years ago uh, quite badly and you know, couldn't walk around on it for six weeks properly and you know, couldn't play sport and things and, and very often when you test their balance scores and test their, their balance in various positions, there is a deficit there one side to the other. So um, certainly something that's worth just uh, bearing in mind and paying attention to because it does obviously have very important ramifications for the golf swing as well. You've got to be well balanced as, as you as professionals know very well indeed. So I'm not going to talk much more about that. The ankle is also prone to wear and tear and prone to to, to cartilage problems, they're, they're called osteochondral defects basically, uh, that's just a, a chip in the cartilage in the bone but that tends to give people a problem at the front of the ankle there and that can mean that rolling on the ankle and walking up and downhill can be quite uncomfortable for them as well so sometimes they might end up limping around the golf course. That generally happens after a, uh, a trauma, one of those sprain injuries or recurrent injuries. So that's basically what I was talking about, just stretching out the ligaments. These are the various grades of sprain um, to the point where you're actually then uh, tearing the, the, the ligament and, and then it doesn't unfortunately return back to the normal state and, uh, and the, the ankle will then be more lax uh, as a result of that. So you'll need to work harder on the, the muscles on the outside, those perineal muscles down the outside of the uh, calf to stabilise the foot and the ankle. So let's talk just briefly a little bit more about what it means uh, for a golfer who's had these injuries. You know, we've already had some questions about this from, from those tuning in online. Um, you know, how long do these injuries take to repair? Uh, well, muscle strains, depending on the severity we're talking about, maybe two to six weeks. Ligaments, unfortunately much longer. It could be uh, four to twelve weeks, but it could take as long as twelve months potentially. Um, if someone's had a really bad ankle sprain, it can take a, a, a very long time. Um, so it, it does depend on the severity of the injury. Um, in terms of tendon problems, again, it's probably a month to three months, four to 12 weeks. Um, 
issues in the shoulder can often take longer. These rotator cuff tendon problems can be quite persistent and quite problematic, particularly if there are certain things that people are doing to re-aggravate their shoulder during their day-to-day -day life or their work life or their sporting life. So um, these things can take quite a while and they may need a multimodal approach in terms of treatment. So um, that's something to, to obviously bear in mind and occasionally these uh, problems in the shoulder do warrant surgery just to shave off a bit of bone if there's a bit of a spur in the bone just to create a bit more space for those tendons to pass through. Disc bulges and disc herniations in the spine, really important one unfortunately for, for golfers. Again this really depends. Some uh, symptomatic discs will settle down relatively quickly over about six weeks but it can take up to a year and sometimes these things really uh, don't settle down for a very long period of time and, and people can end up having multiple injections to try and get the, the pain to calm down, so cordal epidurals uh, or um, uh, nerve root blocks to try and get the offending nerve that's being inflamed and irritated to calm down so they're not getting the, the shooting pain down their leg uh, from that. And of course a, a small minority do go on to require back surgery where they'll uh, potentially cut out a little bit of the offending disc, the bulge, just to make sure that the, the nerve isn't being uh, compressed or inflamed and irritated. As far as arthritis is concerned, we've touched on that a bit already, it's not going to heal up per se, but you can help to manage the symptoms and help manage the, the joint mechanics. So. Uh, in, in people with arthritis, we're usually talking about people over the age of 50 in this situation, but it can sometimes occur earlier in life. Um, what you want to do is make sure that you're not loading those particular joints too much at any one time. So regular gentle movement is definitely good. It keeps the fluid inside the joint moving around and circulating, providing nourishment and uh, making sure that the joint surfaces are gliding as freely as possible. Uh, but the cartilage itself, once it's worn, isn't really going to grow back. Um, and in worst case scenarios, obviously, if the cartilage is really worn and someone's getting a lot of pain and a lot of stiffness, um, then they may go on to have joint replacement, and that's obviously particularly common uh, in the hip and in the knee. So, we had a discussion again about when people can potentially practice and play. I'd always say it depends on the individual and if you've had a significant injury and one that requires uh, the attention of a healthcare professional, you want to explain to them that you're wanting to get back to golf and playing uh, at some stage and you want to take their advice about when that's best to do so uh, and make sure that they're aware um, and from your client's perspective as, as teaching professionals, make sure that um, they have been given or ask them about whether they've been given rehabilitation advice and whether they're following all of that through because they, they should still be doing that when they're returning back to, to practicing and playing again um, and it's important that they keep going with all of that to make sure that the area is as strong and as fully functioning again as possible and hopefully injury resistant for the future. So how can you help speed the process up? Well, a lot of that is about the, the rehabilitation. Also, making sure that you, you do do things like warming up and cooling down after play, because that will help to reduce the impact of any injuries and making sure that your joint and muscle mechanics are as good as possible while you are playing. Another key question, are my swing mechanics making injury more likely? Well, um, hopefully not if they're undergoing coaching, I'm sure that's not likely to be the case, um, but obviously uh, many people do have poor or suboptimal um, movement mechanics and so um, poor technique can certainly have a role to play in that. Um, I'm sure that's something though that um, most serious golfers um, uh, tackle by seeing a, a PGA pro and, and getting advice from their pro about that. So loss of the spinal curves, for example, a huge problem as far as back issues are concerned. So if someone's got a reverse pivot and they're going this way and then back this way, there are obviously going to be compression points in the spine. And then when they're trying to rapidly generate force going this way, they're hyperextending their spine, they're rotating and laterally flexing, putting an awful lot of stress on the body. 
um, that's going to inevitably be a problem and you'd have to say, well, it's probably not a question of if they develop back pain, rather it's likely to be a question of when. So making sure that the body's moving in the best possible way um, in, in the swing is not just important for consistent results in golf, but obviously also as far as injury risk is concerned, it's very important as well. And poor balance as well, clearly, um, if someone's not very well balanced, then at some stage they're likely to um, start to lose their joint angles and their spine angles, and so again, that's likely to have an impact too. Um, and if they haven't got sufficient flexibility, clearly, as we discussed earlier, that's going to have key ramifications there as well. So on the days that someone's playing, I'd certainly make sure that they warm up 15 minutes or, or more, um, would be good, certainly 10 minutes in the study we talked about earlier. If, patient, uh, if people um, who had back pain um, or those who didn't warmed up for 10 minutes or more, they were less likely to experience back problems that day and less likely to have symptoms um, during the course of the study period. So a warm-up is really important. Take time to do that and go and hit some balls beforehand as well. So maybe a quick warm-up at home or in the locker room go and hit a few balls in the net, or if you've got time on a range and you've got access to that, do that. You'll play better, your body will feel more comfortable, and you're, you're more likely to play sustainably throughout the course of your golfing career. Obviously, lots of people ask, well, should I get treatment? Well, that depends on, on a variety of things. I think, uh, just as a general rule of thumb, if something isn't going away after a couple of weeks, um, you want to start thinking about getting some advice about that particular problem. So... You can go and see your, your GP and get some advice from them. Um, if it's a sports-related, golf-related injury, you might well want to, to see uh, a chiropractor, osteopath, physiotherapist who uh, understands golf and understands the mechanics of, of what you're asking your body to do in that situation and make sure that they give you the relevant rehabilitation advice for that injury as well as any hands-on treatment. So you don't have to rush into doing anything um, to uh, invasive necessarily and you may not necessarily need to have lots of treatment but at least getting some advice from a healthcare professional sooner rather than later may mean that you, uh, you don't end up having a, a long and drawn out um, period where you can't play or a long and drawn out recovery period. So more severe or long standing problems do obviously sometimes warrant imaging and lots of people who have pain are obviously very keen to get MRI scans and things like that. Um, they obviously can provide a lot of potentially useful information but there are pitfalls there as well and particularly with spinal problems because you see all the defects in the spine and if you're anyone over the age of 35 or 40 well you're likely to see on an MRI scan some wear and tear, maybe a disc bulge or two. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be someone that's got pain. So studies have been done looking at individuals uh, across the, the, the population and found that ordinary people who don't regularly experience back pain will also show some of these signs of wear and tear. So it's not necessarily the wear and tear that's causing the pain. Um, so uh, that can be a problem sometimes if people end up getting very concerned and worried about the fact that they've got wear and tear in their spine. Uh, when really it's just a normal part and parcel of uh, living on planet Earth for a certain period of time. So um, I think getting the advice of a healthcare professional that you trust is important. Um, if you need to see a specialist or you're advised to see a specialist in certain situations, absolutely, then, then, then that's worth doing. And uh, very often that will uh, coincide with some imaging that they'll do and, and they'll then explain uh, the best route forwards for you from that perspective um, and uh, your GP or, or other healthcare professionals can, can also uh, advise you on some of those things too. But look after your body, I think that's the key thing for anyone viewing online and, and for uh, professionals, explain to your clients the fact that essentially they're looking to do some quite stressful things to their body during the golf swing. Um, and they really want to try and look after their body as, as well as possible. Um, as a wise physician once said, uh, those who don't make time for physical activity and exercise will sooner or later have to make time for illness or injury. So do look after yourself. Um, and I use an analogy um, that you might want to just um, think about um, here at the end of the lecture. Um, treat your body a bit like it's a sports car. 
Okay, if you if you think about how you might look after a sports car, well, if it's been in the garage for a while, you wouldn't go straight out and try and floor it straight out the garage. You'd get it warmed up, get the engine warmed up, get the engine oil circulating um, before you started to really try and accelerate. Um, give the car a good run, give it some exercise if it's been in the garage for a while, um, and, and, and get using it a bit more so that you're pumping the oil around it, getting the working surfaces of the car running. Same thing for our bodies, really important to, to do some cardiovascular and resistance exercise. It doesn't have to be really onerous, really hard, but there are a huge number of uh, health benefits, very widespread health benefits from exercising. Um, and if you do the right sort of exercise, it can be really helpful in terms of improving your golf performance as well. So lots of studies have shown doing a six or eight week uh, training program as a golfer can make you able to hit the ball further. Um, very often people see a reduction in their, their handicaps and their scores and things as well. So if you do the right sort of exercise, um, that can really be very helpful as well. So I think we'll leave it there. Um, if there are any other questions, we'll obviously uh, run through all of those, but um, uh, that's the formal part of the, the session over for this evening. Okay.